the book is carefully written. The uh, the Indian movement from Alcatraz to Wounded Knee. Uh, Marilyn calls me, a friend of mine calls me every once in a while. She, she's a volunteer for the library in Hazlitt. And every once in a while they have a book sale. She called me once, probably a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, she said they're having a book sale. Pot. She might be interested. Books are 50 cents and a dollar. So I went there and looked around. I didn't see anything I liked. And I did see this book. I had a nice picture, uh, like a hurricane. And so I picked it up. It's only a buck. And then when I got home, I put it away. I looked at the uh, title, like a hurricane, and I said, yeah. Yeah, they was here for a couple minutes, and they, and they took off. And uh, I kind of got the feeling that the title was in, in, implying that uh, we were shortchanged, we were betrayed, uh, they didn't follow through with something that they had committed themselves to, and so forth. So I l let it hang around for a while. And then I saw the book again, and I started skimming through the pages, and I saw some characters that uh, I had met personally. And I met them 20 years after uh, the Alcatraz occupation. So I started reading a little bit more, and uh, I got interested. I got hooked on a book, and I finished it in four or five days, which is fast for me because I don't read a book. I attack a book. I break it down. I analyze it. I just decipher it. And uh, this book was very, very interesting. The, uh, the authors... <clears throat> Our Native American, if I get a chance, I'll define what Amer Native American is and what it is not. Uh, Paul Chat Smith, a Comanche, or actually Comantica, and Robert Warrior in Osage. They're both college educated, and you can tell because the book is carefully written. The uh, title, Like a Hurricane, the word hurricane comes from the Indian word, the Arawakan word in the Caribbean, uh, in the West Indies, uh, huracan. Huracan means great spirit. Some people will say evil spirit, but I say great spirit. There's no way a hurricane can be evil. It's just like the floods in uh, Louisiana. They got no business having <laughs> those kinds of industries or agricultural systems there because you know where the water's coming, so don't blame the water. Don't call it a flood. The uh, definition of a hurricane or description of a hurricane is, is, is a storm that can have winds from 75 to 100, 125, 150 miles an hour, strike suddenly and hit hard, followed with torrential rain. So it hits hard and it does its devastating damage and it disappears. So this title was used to describe this time period of three and a half years from 1969 to 1972, 73. So you got three or four years there. So the further I got into the book, the more I appreciated. And it talks about three occupations, and this was before the poetry Occupy Wall Street. These were real occupations. These were occupations where people, as a result of these occupations, sacrificed their lives physically, economically, career-wise, and reputation-wise. The, the consequences were very, very severe. Now, there were three occupations, like I said. 1969, you had the Alcatraz occupation, which lasted approximately 20 months, almost two years. 1971, you had the Bureau of Indian Affairs occupation. That lasted a few days. That was incredible. I'll talk a little bit about that tonight, but I'm going to concentrate on the Alcatraz occupation. 1973, you had the, vil uh, the village of Wounded Knee occupation, which lasted approximately 71 days. <clears throat> Each one of these occupations had criminal prosecutions, and death, primarily or, or, or uh, always on the side of the indigenous people. Now, I want to give a definition, and we got some, some grammarians in the audience, so I want to make sure I got it right. I want to give a definition of occupation and the concept. It comes from the fresh, fr French word, occupare, to possess, to seize. And they got it from Latin.
to take possession of by settlement or seizure. Two, to take hold possession of as by conquest, invasion. Three, to dominate. Four, to take up space and time. Different kinds of occupation. I notice some similarities in these three occupations. For example, the physical occupation. The structure was iconic. You had Alcatraz Island, very, very iconic. Then you had the Bureau of Indian Affairs, iconic. And then you had Wounded Knee, historically iconic. Always there were large numbers of invaders. And I think this gave the invaders a sense of security and warmth and righteousness. They made sure that they had an army of publicity because publicity contributed to that security because they put themselves on the world stage and they said or were saying, you can take our lives. We want the world to see what you do and what, what you have done, what you do, and what you will continue to do. They always frame or use as leverage the threat that give us what we want or kill us. It's pretty bold. Maybe naive even, but bold. Another form of occupation is preoccupation. Now, Doug and I went to a meeting for Occupy Wall Street here in Lansing a couple years ago, and in the meeting when I spoke, I cautioned them about going from occupation to preoccupation, and the example I gave them was Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez was very successful with his uh, boycotts and picketing and legal maneuvers. So the farmers, the ranchers, agribusiness discovered if they could get him in the court and keep him in the court, that they could take him out of the fields, that they could stop him from organizing, that he would lose his momentum, and it proved to be very, very effective. Occupy Wall Street, and I, and I said this that night when they had their meeting, that they were so preoccupied with every single injustice that was, that was being committed by big business and government, that every single time there was injustice, they would call their troops out, their foot soldiers, and they would picket, and they would boycott, and they would have uh, press conferences. So they would call on their foot soldiers again, the common people. Uh, for example, uh, help me out, Doug, uh, the Patriot Act was one of them, and then something else came out at the time. Fracking came out, that became a big deal, et cetera. So they were just, in, in fact, what was interesting is the guy who was heading the, the meeting said, he used these gestures and says, I can't take it. I have too much to do. There's so much coming at me. A few, a few weeks later, they didn't exist anymore. So preoccupation is a strategy used by people in power, okay, to neutralize you or to make you extinct. Wounded knee, one of the occupations. The criminal justice system, after 71 days, and they surrendered, after somebody was killed, boom, that was it. It's too serious. They stopped. Running out of food, they were being starved. The criminal justice system figured that if they could just get him to court, no matter what the charge, get him to court, keep them going to court, you would drain their resources and you would drain their foot soldiers. Uh, during the time that they were there for those 71 days, they made 556 arrests. But they kept taking them to court. And the American Indian Movement aim was limited in its finance, was limited in its time. So eventually, 
they disintegrated aim by preoccupying them. In the Alcatraz movement, I'm going to show, because that's the one I want to talk about tonight, how they were preoccupied. Now, I talk about reoccupation, which is something that primarily as minorities, I can't speak for anybody else, but indigenous people is something we have to do. Because you can go occupy a building. You can get a lot of publicity. You can get a lot of nobility, okay? But you gotta take back your soul. You gotta re reoccupy yourself. I talk about atavism, atta, to go back, to look back. Atavism, to look back to your ancestry. I wanna read something here. It's by, by S.R.B. Solomon of West Africa who changed about 1897 his name to Atoll Auma, expressed a malaise increasing and ever more deeply felt throughout the colonial world. Quote, the greatest calamity of West Africa that must be combated tooth and nail is the imminent loss of ourselves. Let them rob our lands, but let them see that they do not rob us of ourselves. They do so when we are taught to despise our own names, institutions, customs, and laws." End of quote. And I think a lot of times we look at the battleground and we say the battleground's out there and we gotta go upside the white man's head or the oppressor's head and we're going to free ourselves. No, we have to go inside of ourselves first and foremost. Because as long as we don't take over our soul, ourselves, we can be easily manipulated. When the cavalry fought the Indians, here this young nation called the United States, or they call themselves America as well, when they defeated them in battle, they would dismount the Indians. They would cut their hair. They would change their names. They would force a new religion upon them. We have to reoccupy that which is important to us. Again, to go and have a confrontation in a battlefield that is actually fictitious can be worthless. We have to take back our names, our hair, our self-image, recreate the clan system, be unafraid of saying that we have no issue with being communal. We're not embarrassed about that. We have to take back our history, such as the paper tigers are trying to do. And we have to pick the battlefields. And we have to take back our community. I titled this section, and these writers are very careful not to use the word genocide. The word appears, but it's through somebody else. And the Gen Geneva Convention defines genocide as the systematic elimination of a people, or their language, or their sustenance. So you don't have to be dead to be a victim of genocide. You can be alive. I gave a lecture a couple years ago to young people, primarily blacks in East Palo Alto, who were high school and college, and I talked about genocide. And I talked about Richard Pryor tells, has this one little kid, he talks about this white guy. White guys come up and say, hey man, why you guys always holding your thing, man? Why you guys always got your hand down there? Why you guys always holding your thing? And he said, because that's all we got left. Genocide, genitals. When you don't have control of the creativity, of rebirth, okay, you got a problem. Somebody else has taken our creativity. We see the world through somebody else's eyes. We interpret the world through somebody else's eyes. Now, I... I 
I call this genocide through legislation, and let me justify that. Treaties, treaties, hello? Treaties, in its most basic definition, means a contract between two or more parties. But you can't make a treaty unless you're a sovereign nation state. Treaties were originally made between white Americans and Indians. And Indians were treated as sovereign entities. In a treaty, or in treaties made with Indians, it was understood, for example, that this treaty was the supreme law of the land as written in the Constitution. In a treaty, and even though, in a sense, in reality, guns were being held to your head, these treaties were made under duress, you were being told that in exchange for land, land will be reserved for you that came to be called reservations. In addition to that land, as the government, we will protect, protect and promote you. We will provide you with commodities and services until the end of time. That ain't welfare. You take all this land and build your nation, one of the most powerful nations in the history, probably the most powerful nation in the history of mankind, and you give some giant reservations, you're done good. That's not welfare. And, and, and treaties are not made unilaterally. They're agreed upon between parties. So Indians were, were viewed as sovereign people. In 1830, you had the Indian Removal Act. The concept of Indian removal, Kathy, came from Thomas Jefferson. But it wasn't until Jackson, President Jackson came into office, that he put the mechanism that got it going. Okay? So that's 1830. And what that meant was that all Indians east of the Mississippi would be moved west of the Mississippi by force, irrespective of earlier made treaties. To, ac to accommodate this movement of indigenous people in such large numbers in 1834 with the Indian Intercourse Act, they created Indian Territory. I thought it all was Indian Territory. But anyway, they carved it out of the states of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. 1871, it's called Section 71, Congress unilaterally decided that, number one, they would no longer make treaties with the indigenous people. Number two, the indigenous people are not sovereign. And that's very important to understand. Again, that's using legislation. Legislation means you can pass laws without the consent of people that you're passing laws against or for. Now, the reason why I talked about the Removal Act, you say, oh my God, that was a long time ago, man. I'm glad they don't do that anymore or anything like that. Well, let me bring you up to date. General Lotman Act, that was in 1887. So at this time by, I think it was all the way up to 1934, Indians and reservations were in possession of over 130 million acres of land. And then General Allotment Act, or the Dawes Act in 1887, was passed. And here's what it did. Keep in mind, Indians are communal people. Indians at the time did not embrace private ownership, private property. They were communal. 
good or bad. Reservations were parceled into 160 acre units and allotted to individual Indians, the head of families. Not each and every one of them. Indians and reservations were communal. They were not private. This was not a homestead act, and this is interesting. You were not required to live on it or even farm it. It was given to you. Land was held in trust by the government for 25 years. After 25 years, it became taxable property and now subject to seizure in the event of non-payment. That sound familiar? White folks are going through that right now with the banks and houses. If you get a chance, in fact, and Maryland's gone through it, look up uh, Welcome to the Reservation by Russell Means. And he makes that parallel, how now it's happening to white folks in general. Now, taxable property, uh, how do you pay taxes on a property when you don't have jobs? You got 90% unemployment on most reservations. How do you pay for that? Congress bypass the tribal government purposely. That's not sovereign. That's not government to government. Originally, like I said, up to 1934, 130 million acres. Because of this act, the General Allotment Act, Indians lost 90 million acres, or 67 percent. This law was passed by Congress and it was being pushed by white settlers and white farmers who wanted more Indian land. And I'm leading up to this book, some of this is in this book, and, 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 and part of that General Allotment Act is what they call fractionation. Fractionation means if they gave me 160 acres to my family, okay, we divide that among the family. When I die and my wife dies, my grandkids and their grandkids and their grandkids all split up that 160 acres. In fact, you have some land titles that are for one square foot. Think you can do some of that, Charles? So let's move on. Termination. Termination 1950. Kathy, Dylan Meyer, okay, becomes the new commissioner in 1950. I, I, I tease Kathy because her dog's name is Dylan. And I was fond of Dylan until I found out that uh, his ancestry was questionable. <laughs> but he becomes a new commissioner, and he comes up with this concept of terminate. Okay, so again, Congress is taking this action. All right, termination. Terminate. All programs terminate Indian tribes, terminate treaty responsibilities, terminate tribal governments, reservations. What's interesting about Mr. Dillon is that he was the man who ran the Japanese internment camps in World War II. So what you're saying to indigenous people is that we're going to treat you as prisoners of war, which is what reservations were. Prisoners of war. Indian Relocation Act, 1956. That's what I'm saying. You're looking at Indian removals. Oh my God, they were so bad back then. But you see, it continues. Elimination through legislation. Indian Relocation Act, 1956. So the government wanted to get Indians off the reservations into the cities. They were given one-way bus tickets to large cities. Oakland, LA, Dallas, Denver, Chicago. You ever wondered how they got there? It was a relocation act. One-way bus ticket. And I didn't find it in this book. It talked about termination, but it didn't say, and I have found in the past in other documentation, that in addition to getting a one-way bus ticket, you signed off treaty responsibilities with the government. 
Okay. So you were done. So if you came back to the reservation, you had, you were not entitled to any type of services. Indians in the Bay Area, there's a lot of them. How'd they get there? Indian relocation. One of these individuals I met, and he told me how powwows got started, and he started in the Bay Area. And the reason why they started in the Bay Area, you had all these different Indians that came from all over. Just because you're Indian doesn't mean you get along. You get all these Indians from all over, and they weren't, there was nothing to pull them together. So they came up with this concept. Well, there was powwows traditionally, but they came up with this, this modern concept of powwows to get Indians together to, to talk about social things, political things, uh, language reinforcement, just developing networking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Today, powwows are strictly for dancing and making money and getting prizes. They've lost their way. They're no longer for bringing the community together uh, and, and, and consolidating political power. Reading, reading from the book, it says, the Bay Area Indian community, Oaks, who's one of the guys I'm going to talk about, joined was one of the largest in the nation, and that was no accident. The American government developed programs during the 1950s to move Indian people from reservations to cities, to assimilate them as quickly as possible, and to undermine reservation life. This was a departure from earlier policies only a few decades earlier. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal proposed an agenda of Indians so unique that some in Congress attacked it as communistic. John Collier, a progressive New York social worker, served as Roosevelt's Indian commissioner. The criticism had little impact. The wish to terminate, relocate, and assimilate. In other words, you disappear. You go mainstream, you disappear. The program these promises of jobs. The program rarely lived up to the promises and the BIA propaganda. Jobs were hard to find and hard to keep. Housing expensive. The cities were lonely places, and the Indians generally ended up in ghetto neighborhoods. Nearly a third of those who rode the bus on the bureau on the bureau's dime returned to the reservation. Most, however, stayed. There's a story. <clears throat> it's a collateral readings I did where this agent on one of the reservations, this white agent, took this family to one of these large cities and dropped them off. By the time he got back to the reservation, they was already there. <laughs> they knew they didn't want to be there. So now the response. This is where the occupation comes in. All these years, all these decades of being invisible, being overlooked, being unheard, being eliminated, okay, methodically, Indians decide to take a stand. Affected by the black civil rights movement and the brown civil rights movement that were going on simultaneously, they decided to make their move. So they come up with the idea of occupying Alcatraz. Alcatraz was closed in 1962. Alcatraz was at the time the most secure prison in the United States. It was on, of course, Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay. Now, people like Machine Gun Kelly, uh, Al Capone, Birdman and Alcatraz, they were all there, so it was a very, very famous prison. But I want to go back in time again to talk about a treaty. It's called the Fort Laramie Treaty. One of the provisions in the Fort Laramie Treaty made between the sovereign Lakota and the United States government was that if federal land is abandoned or is a surplus, that Indians have an immediate right to that land. So the people who had intended to invade Alcatraz thought about this. They said, well, we, we got an angle. We got an opportunity. We got a treaty to back us up and to shield us. Well, actually, after further research, 
they found that that treaty related specifically to the Lakota and not to all Indians all over the United States. But that became irrelevant after a while. 1964, 40 Indians traveled to Alcatraz by boat and they claimed the island. Made a statement, offered 40, 47 cents an acre for the uh, island because that's what Indians were paid when the white man came. And they left, so it was a publicity stunt. 1969, we get the real invasion. There's some personalities that need to be observed. They're very, very important. Uh, one of the most important is, uh, is a man by the name of Richard Oakes. Richard Oakes was a Mohawk Indian from New York who was on that relocation program, who ended up on the western coast, California, and became a student activist at San, Fra San Francisco State University. A very handsome, a very powerful looking uh, Indian. Very, very proud. He was married. He had children. People were saying that he looked like Victor Mature. Now, us older people know that was a very handsome actor. Okay, if you don't know, good for you. Richard Oakes becomes an extremely powerful figure with a very sad ending. And I'll bring that up a little bit later. The other person is Adam Nordwell. His Indian name, and I have to smile when I say Indian name, because it really gets me when people say, my Indian name is, I got one name and it's Indian. I don't know any white people got a white man's name and an Indian name. I got one name and it's Indian. I don't have two. I call it a closet name if you say it's my Indian name, because if you ain't hearing it, you ain't got it. Anyway, Adam Nord uh, Nordwell was an independent businessman. He ran a termite control company. He had about six or seven employees, so he was doing pretty well. He ended up in the Bay Area because he thought he was on his way to the Korean War but never got called. So he went there to spend time, I believe, with, with his uh, uh, grandmother or somebody in his family. He was married to Bobby. She was a Shoshone Indian from Nevada, from the reservation there. This is a guy who 20 years later after this occupation I ran into by accident in my travels in Fallon, Nevada, which is where he was living at the time. And I have to tell you that when I... When you go on reservations, if you're, if you're indigenous, and especially if you got long hair, and you got money in your pocket, and you got a nice looking truck, you better be very careful because you become a target. Uh, they have what's called the uh, Serious Crimes Act. I think it's a serious Crime, Major Crimes Act, I believe it is. Meaning that any major crimes have to be handled by the FBI and the federal courts that cannot be handled by Indians, again, a blow to sovereignty, okay? So there's a lot of FBI agents on these reservations, and I got a nice car, I got money in my pocket, uh, and they haven't seen me, so they're thinking, this dude must be an infiltrator. He might be FBI. So I was very, very careful whenever I was on a reservation. So I would go to cultural centers. So in Fallon, Nevada, there was this cultural center uh, on this reservation at this at this house. So I went there and the lady came out. She's real, real nice. And she started talking about her husband. I saw some incredible sculpturing. Well, this man was Adam Nordwell. She said, he'll be back in a couple of days. So I stayed in my truck for a few days, uh, looked around, came back, met him, very, very nice guy. And uh, I stayed there about a week. And I was teaching this grandson or grandson, I can't remember if there were one or two, how to box, and he was uh, showing me his shop and how to sculpture and giving me an education on Indian religion, etc. This was during the time uh, that uh, Uncle Thomas was trying to be a uh, um, Supreme Court justice when they had that one black girl who accused him of talking about King Kong Dong and stuff like that. I forget her name. What year was that? I don't remember what year of that. But anyway, it was that summer. Okay. Anita Hill, thank you. Thank you very much. Also, he gave me a copy of the book, Alcatraz, Alcatraz, which he wrote about the Alcatraz invasion. And I read about it. And the thing that stands out in my mind is Richard Oakes. 
and the nobility that they gave him, the respect that they gave him. He also gave me an article that was in Newsweek magazine where he flew, him and his wife flew to Italy, got out of the plane in his regalia, Indian regalia, stuck a staff in the ground and says, I claim Italy. Just like, the, <laughs> just like Columbus did here in the Americas. Of course, publicity is not. Another important individual is Tim Finley, a white man who was a reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle. Tim Finley is the man who got Richard Oakes and Adam Nordwell together. He had a Halloween party and he hooked these guys up because both these guys wanted to do something about Alcatraz Island. But they didn't know each other. They heard of each other. They saw and heard that they had similar feelings about the takeover of Alcatraz. So he managed to get them together to this party and they got to talking about invading Alcatraz. And he had a lot of reporters there. And they, he swore them to silence and don't tell anybody, this is what we're going to do on such and such a day. Now, I met Tim Finley in Fallon, Nevada a few years after I met Adam Nordwell. By then he had moved there. Okay, and I gotta say, I didn't like this dude. I didn't like this dude, man. But anyway, that's not important. Uh, he introduced, uh, he being uh, Adam Nordwell, introduced Tim Finley as his stepson. And in the book here it talks about he was a stepson. But I don't know at what point in time he was a stepson before or after this. Uh, Tim Finley played an incredible role, and I wonder if he was one of the originators uh, of the invasion. And he wrote, once the invasion took place, Finley wrote some very beautiful articles about this takeover, making this takeover very noble, very beautiful, good for Indians, and good for mankind in general. And at the end, he wrote a terrible article about the take takeover and change people's opinions. Another one is a young, beautiful Shoshone Bannock woman. Her name, Lanara Means. She's not related to Russell Means, as far as I know. Very beautiful. Uh, in, in, in fact, Jane Fonda, and, and this became a problem. She was an activist and organizer on the island. Jane Fonda, would take her off the island, all these beautiful parties to these beautiful homes, and talk to her about making a movie with her. And this created jealousy among the people who were on the island, who were being ignored. This is the same problem that Richard Oakes would have. He spent a lot of time off the island, making speeches, raising money, and <laughs> hanging out with famous people, especially Hollywood people. That's the preoccupation that I'm talking about Hollywood people, they're always there sucking somebody's blood, stealing some people's fire. All right. So anyway, on November 9th, 1969, is the day that Adam Nordwell and Richard Oakes decide to make their move and invade the island. Okay. So, so they show up at, at, at uh, Fisherman's Wharf, and there's a bunch of reporters there. And there's a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of uh, supporters, and there's a bunch of invaders, but there's no boats. So Adam Nordwell is very concerned about the embarrassment. Okay, but in the distance he spots this schooner, I guess they call it, this boat that was decorated like a pirate ship, and the guy on it was dressed like a pirate. And he had a, a cannon which he was shooting. So he signaled the guy over and he said, would you do us a favor? Would you take us to the island? He said, I won't take you, but I'll take you around there. I will not land there. He said, okay, cool. We got to do something to save ourselves from this embarrassment. So, so this captain, this fictitious captain, and the invading Indians get on the boat and they start to go around and Richard Oakes jumps out of the boat, swims 250 yards at least to the island. He had to get there. He had to make it real. And this water is cold and dangerous. And three other people jump out of that boat to touch the island. 
to be a part to make that invasion real. Later on in the evening, they're brought back by the Coast Guard. November 20th, Adam Nordwell is out of town. Richard Oakes says, now we're going to have a real invasion. Okay, so he gets his foot soldiers together, who are primarily college students and primarily indigenous. Now, there's 78 occupiers in this invasion, and they have boats. So they get there. And their authors say, the co-authors say, later, drums and singing from a victory powwow fill the air. The adrenaline rush of their feet kept it going for hours, and night turned to day with a few of the 78 occupiers getting much sleep. For the most part, the island's new residents were strangers to each other. Various sets of them had worked together for months, planning for the island. Many signed on at the last minute, dressed more for a weekend at a friend's house than what would become an extended occupation of a crumbling prison. You couldn't stay in that prison. It was dangerous. There were a few rooms that were available. But it was very, very dangerous to get in those structures. They pretty much stayed out. Didn't have firewood. Didn't have water. Didn't have electricity. Didn't have bathing facilities. Had nothing okay but the way they talk about how they went there sometimes courage has an element of naivete you don't know what you're dealing with but they went the 78 young indians most of them college students shivering on alcatraz that november morning had to choose someone to speak for them this decision unlike others that would follow proved to be easy few would argue that the man to stand in the spotlight was a charismatic Mohawk from San Francisco State, Richard Oakes. He would be their representative, and through him, in theory, they would speak in a single, united, and defiant voice. Logistics, let me give the definition of logistics. One, the art of planning and carrying out military movement, evacuation, and supply. B, the planning and carrying out of any complex or large-scale operation or activity. These invading Indians had no sense of logistics, no sense of reality. But that doesn't discount their courage, and that doesn't discount what they were trying to achieve. I remember when, when we first started the Malcolm X Foundation, I talked about the concept of order, and, and Doug remembers that I gave a definition out of the book of order. And what blew my mind was the secondary definition that says, order brings something into existence. In other words, if you don't have order, it doesn't exist. This is going to sound like Wall Street or Occupy Wall Street, but that's my point. Their choice of Oaks as their, rep, as their spokesperson rather than their leader on the first morning was a reflection of their ideas of unity and consensus and a rejection of the idea of hierarchy. And when it became clear in a few days that they would need more structure, they agreed to have a coordinating council that would organize people into groups to do the necessary work to keep 78 people fed and safe. But plenty of the young, un excuse me, but plenty of the young occupiers had drunk deeply from the well of anarchism, popular among student radicals of the time, and even the nebula structure of a coordinating council was, to them, too much. In a telling move, the group elected Ed Castillo, the young professor of Native American Studies at UCLA, to be in charge of, quote, security, end of quote. Weighing in at 115 pounds, he was supposed to go around and tell groups of strapping young Indian guys not to drink or do drugs. After a few days and one too many threats of bodily harm, he resigned. <laughs> Do 
By three weeks in, the occupation had become a freewheeling event that no spokesperson, coordinating counsel, or reporter could keep track of. Again, I want to go back to the, con the concept of reoccupation, of occupation from within. Charles, we had a discussion a couple weeks ago about how minority communities have got to take control of their communities and not expect outsiders to do that for us. Before you go on a venture like this, you got to hold each and everybody accountable. Going up there and threatening people ain't going to get you jack. They decided to call themselves Indians of all tribes. And they put together an Alcatraz proclamation. And I'm going to read it. It's about a page long, but I think it's important enough to read. And, 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 and this Alcatraz thing is so important to me because it became the standard, it became the model, it became the inspiration for these other occupation. And it was, and was read by Adam Nordwell. Alcatraz Proclamation. Proclamation. We, the Native Americans, reclaim the land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians by right of discovery. That's a whole new topic if you talk about right of discovery. I'm not going to cover that tonight. We wish to be fair and honorable in our dealings with the Caucasian inhabitants of this island and hereby offer the following treaty. So you see they use the word treaty. We will purchase said Alcatraz Island for $24 in glass beads and red cloth, a precedent set by the white man's purchase of a similar island about 300 years ago. We will give to the inhabitants of this island a portion of land for his own to be held in trust by the American Indian government and by the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs. <laughs> to hold in perpetu perpetuity for as long as the sun shall rise and the rivers go deep to the sea. We will further guide the inhabitants in the proper way of living. We will offer them our religion, our education, our life ways in order to help them achieve our level of civilization and thus raise them and all their white brothers up from their savage and unhappy state. We feel that this is so called we feel that this so called Alcatraz Island is more than suitable for an Indian reservation, as determined by the white man's own standards. By this we mean that this place resembles most Indian reservations in that it is isolated from modern facilities and without adequate means of transportation. It has no fresh running water. It has inadequate sanitation facilities. There are no oil or mineral rights. There is no industry, or so, and so unemployment is very great. There are no health care facilities. The, so, the soil is rocky and not productive, and the land does not support game. There are no educational facilities. The population has always exceeded the land base. The pop, excuse me, the population has always been held as prisoners and kept dependent upon others. Further, it would be fitting and symbolic that ships from all over the world ent entering the Golden Gate would first see Indian land and thus be reminded of the true history of this nation. This tiny island would be a symbol of the great lands once ruled by free and noble Indians. Uh, in, in, in my own book, and I got this quote from somebody else, uh, some other source, uh, I write, history is written by the victors and the losers write poetry. This is poetry. Trying to, trying to teach uh, or make a point, give a point, but it's poetry. After showing why Alcatraz, now we're talking about the goals. After showing why Alcatraz was similar to an Indian reservation, the proclamation said five institutions would rise on this site. So this became their demand. A center for Native American studies would include traveling universities. The American Indian Spiritual Center would allow the practice of ancient tribal religion and sacred healing ceremonies. The center, Indian Center of Ecology would carry out scientific research, depollute the water and air, and establish facilities to dissolve seawater for human benefit. The island's great Indian Training Center would operate a restaurant, offer good job training, and sell Indian arts and crafts. Finally, the said proclamation of Alcatraz would remain as it is a fitting place to remember Indian captives and to teach 
the noble and tragic events of Indian history, including the Trial of Tears and the Massacre of Wounded Knee. Uh, in addition to that, Indians were saying, we're not going to get off an, or, or, or we're going to continue this occupation. We must have that, plus we must have free and clear title to this island, which became a sticking point later on. Because four months later, the federal government was pretty much willing to yield to most of these demands. Now, so we, so we see here about three or four weeks later, we see the uh, disintegration of Alcatraz Island. Blame sheer boredom, exuberant anarchism, run amok, or a youthful commitment to hard partying, fights, and accidents became more and more common, as did a general lack of cohesion and purpose among those who weren't part of the leadership. Those who weren't part of the leadership, because the, part, the, the leadership was getting partied out. They were partying off the island with the celebrities, with the politicians, with the Hollywood people, staying in nice homes, getting showers every day, dressing night. Nice maybe even pocketing some money, who's to say? And, and, but they were also bringing in money. So there was a lot of suspicion, there was a lot of distrust that was going on. And along with the plumbers and electrician who made their way over after Thanksgiving, criminals and others from the underside of the Indian world began to arrive. Street pumps and wireless for the mission, etc. When the occupation's fame prompted visits from celebrities for tours of the island, Castillo hung back from the flurry of excitement. Embarrassed, he watched fellow citizens go running to stand in the wake of Anthony Quinn or Jonathan Winters. He considered the people who did this nothing more than fawning psychophants. If I pronounce that right. Say it again. Thank you. What does that mean? Oh, okay. I like that. I got to use that. <laughs> That's like the vortex. Okay. What's interesting about this, Anthony Quinn is actually has an indigenous background, Antonio Quintana, but you know, you don't hear him talk about it. All right. He ended up in Italy. Now here he is hanging out with the Indians. It's kind of interesting. So, so what I want to show, what I'm trying to show is deterioration because the, the authors say something that is very, very important, and they say it in the preface. They say, Hurricane is a continuing education and the missteps and errors of that movement, which, like all others, often fell short of its goals. At the same time, it is also true that this undertaking has only increased our admiration for the imagination and daring displayed by so many courageous Indian people. Uh, you got to learn the past to better perform in the future. And that's what's valuable about this book, because it reveals the problems that need to be examined and in the future maybe corrected. What they refrained from doing, though, was ask questions about all the money they kept hearing was coming in hand over fist. Doing so was sure to bring a crew from the security contingent down on them and fast, intimidating them and telling them they didn't know, need to know or need to worry about finances. Now these are people becoming the very same thing that they were complaining about because they didn't take the responsibility of reoccupation, of internal occupation. Okay, let's go occupy some as if that in and of itself is going to take care of everything else. Alcatraz belonged to Indians of all tribes and that was exactly the problem. No one had imagined how much goodwill, attention, and fame, or how much disunity, discord, and heartbreak would come on the heels of the late night crossing in November. But you've got to remember that these people were never taught, raised, or knew about occupation. There's no training ground for that. Things got so bad that, that Richard Oakes was limited in his functions there because he was gone a lot and people were suspicious that he was making money, he was going to parties, 
he was having a good time, and he was ignoring his, ignoring his responsibilities. I don't know. But I know this, the jealousy got so bad that his 12-year-old daughter was thrown from a balcony and murdered. Now, some people say she wasn't murdered, but the feeling is very strong that there was no way that she just fell off this balcony because he was staying in the warden's old, uh, office. Uh, I don't know if it had a place for living space, but they were living there, and it was one of the nicer places. Okay, so these are real things that you got to deal with. Now, Tim Finley, the guy I told you about, who was a stepson of Adam Nordwell, writes a scathing article in the paper about what is going on because this, you know, this, this, this is going into the second year and it's just getting worse and worse. The island, the article said, and I, this, is, this is Adam writing his article, excuse me, has turned out into something out of William Golding's nightmarish novel, Lord of the Flies in which children, away from adults and civilization, established their own brutal society. Drunkenness was rampant, mindless van vandalism widespread. In, in the Alcatraz proclamation, the proposed security force, playfully named the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs, was merely an amusing rhetorical jab at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But the BCA had become frighteningly real, young, tough, outfitted, with special jackets and now calling themselves the Thunderbirds roam the island, threatening and beating residents. They were demanding their own building for training, and no one seemed to know what kind of training they had in mind. What had been for a moment a dreamy, idealistic place with real but workable problems was becoming to resemble its own prison setting, and the prisoners were in charge. The author of these series was Tim Finley the very person who brought Richard Oakes and Adam Nordwell together at the Halloween party at his home. If you remember, I talked about that. Now the government, after four months, meets with them, this is several meetings, this one of the meetings says, okay, we can't do Thunderbird University because there's going to be some problems with transporting people there. We can put a museum there. We can tear down the prison and put new buildings there. Uh, we can do a training center. Just about everything they asked for, they would meet. The only condition was that it be sponsored by the, the uh, National Park Service, or the Federal Park Service, National Park, I forget what it's called. Okay? In other words, they'd be in charge of it. And they said, we'll hire you guys here on the island to help with construction, and we'll hire as teachers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we would not give you title to the land. That's not going to happen. So they met, the, the uh, island people met and said, no, we're not going to accept that. I mean, we weren't there, so we can't say whether or not that was a good or bad decision. Man, but that was close. That would have looked like a victory. Okay, that could have been incredibly powerful. But this 2020 vision after it took place, and we're talking about many years after it takes place. Now, after 20 months, there's 15, 15 people left on the island. So people are just sick and tired of it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to write about it. They don't want to join it. Uh, so you got 15 people left. So 30 armed Coast, Coast Guardmen invade the island and take it back. And that's the end of that occupation. But that occupation served as motivate, motivation, inspiration for other takeovers. You had the Bureau of Indian Affairs, 1971. And I'm not going to take the time to explain how they got to Washington, D.C., but there was a, a, a caravan, a coast-to-coast -coast caravan that was put together because of the murder of Richard Oakes, because he was murdered by a white man. Richard Oakes was partially paralyzed because of a beating that he got from Samoans in a bar in the Mission District of San Francisco time before. So white man shot him, went to court, they found him not guilty. They cleared him. Okay. But when he was killed, they wanted to do something to honor him. And so they created this caravan. And in the end, there were 1,000 Indians who appeared in Washington, D.C. with no facilities, no food, no place to stay, nothing. Excuse me. 
Again, what was, that, what was that word? Logistics. Nobody took care of logistics. So they end up going to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and say, hey, man, help us out and so forth. And, and they say, hey, go to the auditorium, wait there, we're going to see what we can do. So they come to them and say, uh, you know what? Why don't you go down, why don't you go down, because they were six blocks from the White House. Why don't you go down the street to the Labor Department and use their auditorium as bigger? So they talked about it and they considered it. And, but there was a scuffle between the police and some Indians outside. So the Indians said, no, nah, we ain't going no place. We're going to stay right here. They had a thousand Indians in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Okay. So a day or two later, uh, they reconsidered. They said, okay, well, there was another place they provided. So all the Indians took off with the exception of a couple. They went there and the doors were locked. So they were betrayed. So they went back. They went back to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and reoccupied it and started just tearing everything up, taking files, stealing files that were uh, in the archives, uh, destroying art, destroying pottery, destroying offices. They were mad. Uh, graffiti, and they began making firebombs. They made so many firebombs that you could smell gas blocks away. So they had hundreds of firebombs. And again, they told the police, you got to take us. If you're going to take us, you're going to take dead bodies. They didn't say it verbatim, but that's how they said it. Okay, give us what we want or kill us. So finally, that lasted a few days, and they were just tired because for a minute it looked like there was going to be an invasion, and then there wasn't. The next day, it looked like an invasion, there wasn't. The next hour, invasion, and they were up and down, up and down, and they just couldn't take it no more. So finally, they said, give us some gas money, and we'll go home. But they did agree that they wouldn't press charges, okay, the federal government. Now, this was just before the, the election, uh, and Nixon, I think Nixon was running again, I'm not sure, uh, but it was a few days before, and this was kept quiet. You didn't hear very much about it in the media. They made sure to keep it quiet. Pardon? 1971, I think it was. Was that Nixon election? Okay. Now, that was a couple of days away, so they were very cool about just going there and dragging people out and so forth. Uh, so they were able to get through that. But that building was destroyed. There was over $2.2 million worth of damage, incredible amount of damage. Uh, and from there, they uh, aimed, dispersed, because this was an American Indian movement, dispersed uh, throughout the country and reconnected uh, with the third occupation, which was the village of Wounded Knee. And I won't get into that unless people want to ask about that. But I would say it, it's an incredible book. If, if you want to learn about what not to do, okay, this is a good book. Uh, these guys did a very good job, and I think they can be very proud of themselves. They did a very good uh, point of document because they told everybody's story, the government side, the Indian side, and kind of like some of their attitudes or perspectives on what was going on. But there's a couple of things I, I, in closing uh, I want to I want to read, and this is particular to Doug. I'm picking on everybody tonight. Okay. Nixon was elected, was it 72? 72? Okay, then that would probably be 72 then. Okay, but it was just before the election, yeah. A couple of days before the election. This is about this is about this is about AIM, and this is for Doug. The, the Twin Cities had dozens dozens of Indian organizations, though most were sponsored by churches, and run by whites. <laughs> AIM, in contrast, had an all Indian board and staff. Now, moving on to moving on to the uh, epilogue and the close. So I found out something very disturbing because of the lack of rigidity, the lack of organization. It was easy to infiltrate AIM. In fact, one of his primary founders, Dennis Banks, it was learned, was an undercover agent for two years. I mean, he was one top three dogs. Clyde Belcourt, Russell Means. Okay, and Dennis Banks. In closing, uh, they say, wounded knee proved to be the final performance of AIM's daring brand of political theater. As quickly as Indian radicalism had exploded on the national stage, it faded, disintegrating under the weight of its own internal contradictions and divisions and a relentless legal assault by federal and state governments. In the months and years following the dissolution 
of the independent Oglala Nation, Indians once again became a flickering, intermittent presence in the public affairs of the United States. As should be clear by now, AIM was never the whole of the Indian movement, but the organization's decline marked a turning point for the rest of Indian activism. Thank you very much. If you got any comments or questions, I'm on the scene. You know, these authors, that's a good question, these authors talked about AIM and these occupation movements as if they were guerrilla movements. They're not guerrilla movements. In a guerrilla movement, you do not take possession of anything except the minds of the people who support you on. You don't take control of anything. You have to be mobile. You have to be secretive. Uh, the, Brown, the Brown Berets, we were called a paramilitary group, which we weren't, but that was character assassination on the part of the press. Uh, we were militant. Uh, we did participate in riots, and I say that with great pride, and that may shock some people. Okay, racism was rampant. Racism was obvious. Segregation was obvious. You didn't see what you see today. In fact, a lot of progress and success and pleasures that people of color enjoy today is because of what people in my era were doing. America was up in flames in the 60s and the 70s. We had had enough, okay? You had the civil rights movement which framed the issues, which framed the goals. And then you had the people who, who respected the words of Malcolm X and H. Rat Brown, and, and Sophie Carmichael, and uh, who's that other cat? I can't think of his name right now. Uh, a couple of, not Farrakhan, okay, keep that guy out of my discussion here. But we were different in that we didn't get a bunch of people together and say we're taking this over. We were aggressive, okay? But that wasn't just our group. That was the entire community almost. We would go play ball like in junior high school, and after basketball, we would go outdoors, and we would line Burdick Street on both sides, waiting for, for cars, automobiles, with white people coming up and down the streets, and stone them, okay? Firebombs were being thrown all over the city. This is Kalamazoo. Okay, this was happening in Omaha. Every night, we would watch the national news, okay, to see what city was burning down. Newark, Compton, Oakland. Chicago, Houston, okay, even even Albion was having riots and so forth. So this was this was not uncommon. So to, the, the 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 parallel is a difference. All right, we were aggressive. We were we did not set ourselves up to be victimized because these cats were victimized. A lot of these cats got killed after the uh, after the takeover in the village of uh, Wounded Knee. There was reported over 300 Indians were murdered. Okay, and it was just—it wasn't just the goons uh, of Wilson, the guardians of the Oglala Nation. The FBI had a lot to do with that. That's well documented. Okay, and they also fixed it so Indians were killing each other. So they became victims, even though they weren't aggressive. They became victims, even though they didn't hurt anybody. They just took possession of stuff which required courage because in one way or another you were going to suffer, okay? I was part of a movement, and there's some brothers out there who can identify with the, the anger that, that brown and black people were experiencing at the time, okay? It's very different today, very, very different today. But you, but you know, you had segregation that was very obvious. When we went roller skating, okay, we had to go on Wednesday night. That was black night, and if you wasn't white, you was black, so that's when I went, okay? We had segregated schools. 
if you if you saw a black man or a brown man who was a, 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 a male man, you was like, man, that dude got a good job. Okay, you didn't see city representatives. You didn't see uh, academic representatives that were of color. All right? that, and, and that's why I tell people the civil rights movement back then was real simply because segregation was real obvious. Now segregation, to me, is in a sense self-imposed because it's interwoven into and it's institutionalized into the system. Okay. Are you happy with that? Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Now. You said Oaks was killed. Oaks, uh, good question. Uh, Oaks was a, was a, used to work in a bar, uh, but he was a big tough dude, and he liked his alcohol. And first, the first time in the Mission District, he had a fight with not one, but five Samoans. Okay, you don't do that. The Samoans are big and bad. They're bad. They paralyze them, partially paralyzed them. They beat them so bad. Uh, this was in San Francisco. This so was San Francisco Mission District. Later on, a few years later, in, in Northern California, I think Man, uh, Mendocino, some, uh, some white man at a, at a YMCA camp shot and killed him. And I don't know all the particulars, but he was saying that he was under attack. This cat was partially paralyzed. He barely walked. Okay. And then after a one, a while wounded, he was going on, and near the end, the courts found him not guilty, or the, the man who had shot him. And people believe that was because of what was going on. We were wounded. They probably were found not guilty anyway. And he had a trial. He was acquitted at trial. The, the white man was judge. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was acquitted. Yeah. Uh, you said you the term earlier, going to war on a fictitious battlefield is worthless. Yeah. Could you explain that? Can you give it? Well, you, I mean, what's a battlefield? I mean, who, who determines who determines what a they want to repeat the question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I said because I believe, for example. Repeat the question. Go ahead. I, I, you know, I just wondered if you could explain that. What, what, you have to. De you have to determine what the battlefield is. Okay. That's for you to determine, not not for them to determine. For example, I have an issue with the electoral process. Okay. I don't think it's the avenue for change real change. And it's been demonstrated again and again and again. Things continue to get worse no matter who's in office. Republicans or presidents, whites or blacks. All right? So the electoral process has failed us. Because, and we find out the electoral process is governed by the plutocrats, the corporate oligarchy. All right? I mean, that's evident for, in, in, in decisions like the Supreme Court decision with, uh, was it uh, Citizens United? Okay. I mean, that's, so, so what do you do? Uh, we, saw in the, we saw in the last election how these billionaires were throwing 25, 30, 40 billion dollars, excuse me, million, millions of dollars into these elections. All right, people that had no business running for office. So, so that's what I mean. So are you going to spend most of your time in that battlefield, or are you going to go and create a grassroots movement where you have real change? The civil rights movement did not come from the presidency. It didn't come from the pro process. It came from the streets. Okay, it's when, it's when black people and brown people went to the streets and they had their strikes and they had their boycotts and they had their picketing and their sit-ins and their prayings. And when they got burned at the counter with cigarette butts and called nigger uh, at Woolworths, that's when change started occurring. And that's when the legislative process began to support uh, some of those movements. So that's what I mean by a fictitious battlefield. Now, it's good to have an occupation to register a complaint and to find out who your warriors are, but it ain't going to get you what you want to get. It ain't going to do it. That's what I mean by that. Can you, can you tie together uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, type of person it's interesting because that's, that's a good point you had brought that up earlier in a private conversation when, when the government came out with uh, termination relocation, allotment and all these other things Indians throughout the country stood up together and was able to dismantle and stop some of that 
They stood up together. They felt threatened. Now you have a threat that's greater. Okay, and, and let me go on record. That that's casino gambling. You got all this money coming in, and people think money is the ultimate source of power, which it isn't. You got all this money coming in, and Indians are doing to themselves what white people couldn't do. For example, what you're talking about. You remember back in uh, Mount Pleasant when they first started uh, doing the gambling? Uh, they were kicking people. They used to beg people to come and join the tribe. But once casino gambling came, they started kicking people off. One time they kicked off a tribal chief. A tribal leader, okay? Uh, and you see this going all over the country. You see, there's a book called Heist. And I'm trying to think of that guy's name who just got out of prison. Uh, I can't think of his name, but they made over $25 million off, dollars off Indians because casino, uh, casino gambling was starting to be uh, promoted amongst Indians amongst Indian uh, reservations. I can't think of Jack Abramoff wrote the book Heist. Now in this book, in this book, they would go to one tribe and say, okay, we understand you don't want that tribe to get a license to practice casino gambling. For a certain amount, we'll do that for you. We'll fight that, okay? Then they went to them and told them the same thing about that tribe. We saw where the, the casinos in Battle Creek and in Mount Pleasant didn't want a casino here in land. That's true capitalism. We are capitalists, not communalists. We are capitalists. And what allows us to do it? Greed for money. Because we think money is the ultimate source of power. And it's not. Money shows you where the power is at. The ultimate source of power is the congregation of people. So, so you see this going all over the country. And you see Indians suing each other in order to keep them, prevent them from having casino gambling. Uh, in the Navajo Reservation, it's against religion to gamble. Now they got one casino, maybe two. Now they're arguing how, how do they disperse the money amongst Navajo. So this is going all over. It's going all over. And if you were, I, I was offered a job in Mount Pleasant many years ago, and I was going to be a, a drug counselor, alcohol counselor. I wasn't interested. I'm, I'm tired of, of, of dealing with those kinds of issues. So that's why I'm interested. Now, if you got an alcohol problem, if you got a drug problem and you got a self-esteem problem and you get more money, you got a bigger problem. Okay, you got to address that problem first. Okay, and that's what I mean again: reoccupation, taking control of our soul. Any more? First of all, I'm the one that broke it down into three sections of occupation. That's not in the book. In, 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 in reading this kind of book, okay, having this kind of conversation is how you do it. And, 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 and making yourself understand, understand that you have to control yourself, your family, your clan, and your community, okay? Uh, otherwise, you're always going to be subject to that. Now, preoccupation, you saw how the court system used it. Nobody ever said you out. That's what they did to Chavez. And that's what they did to Abe. And that's what they did to the brothers, the Black Panthers, and all the other ones. Drag them into court. Okay? Sure. Bury them. Bury them in the court with the money and the attorneys and so forth and so forth. So, yeah, that's, first of all, it's not for me to decide. Okay? It's not for me to decide. I'm, I'm talking about this book. I'm not, I'm not, I would run things a little bit different now that I read this book and it's 20 years later. Okay? I would have been caught up in that same fever because I was caught up in that. Uh, a slime cheaper, okay, uh, and I won't get into that, but now that I got 20 years later to look at it and I'm cool and calm and I ain't under attack, I can, I can, I can re-strategize, re-strategize what I would do in order to really achieve something. Because one of the things to talk about at the end of the book is that AIM got a lot of attention, but they never got any resolution, okay. But there were some byproducts. There were some byproducts and benefits from the fact 
when they register, that they got some brothers out there will take care of business if they got to. Because AIM was real. I mean, AIM was real. And, 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 and so they had to understand these people that, that got these suits and ties on, they might want to listen to them a little bit more. Because that's, that's, how, that's what power does. It goes to the people in the middle and say, hey man, control them people. Keep them away from the castle. Well, in order to do that, Mr. Boss, man, uh, you got to give me a little bit more play. That's what it is for them. So they got more programs. You said you were going to give the definition of Native American. I didn't say I would. I said if you asked that question, you asked that question. Okay? <laughs> Native American. Native American has nothing to do with race. You can be an Indian and not be a Native American, okay? Just because Native American don't mean you're Indian. I'll give you an example. Chamorros. So anybody know what Chamorros is? That's the indigenous people of Guam, which is a possession of the United States. They're Native Americans because they're native to Guam. Samoans are Native Americans. They ain't Indians. Hawaiians, indigenous Hawaiian, are Native Americans. They ain't Indians, right? Okay. Uh, Inuit, Eskimos. They're not Indians, if you want to define it that way. So, so Indian's not a race. When the, the word Indian was brought over by the Spaniards. When the Spaniards came to the Western Hemisphere, they named the entire hem hemisphere Las Indias, the Indies. They called the indigenous people, all of them together, Indios, Indians. The governing body for these Indians was called Concilio de las Indias, Council of the Indies, all right? The laws were called Las Leyes de las Indias. The laws of the Indians. Okay, because Indians had special laws. And that was to distinguish between the people who came from Europe, especially the Spaniards, and the people that was here. That was a distinction. It had nothing to do with race. Because if, but if you look at indigenous people from the North to South Pole, the differences, the differences are, are, are what you call, uh, what's the word? It's a chemical word when uh, you have uh, a water and heavy water. Isotope, isotopic. They're so fine. They're so fine. They're not really differences, if you want to do that. So when you say Indian, you're talking about the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, the relationship to the land, the relationship to the line. They were pre, pre-European, pre-American, pre-Latino, pre-Hispanic, pre-Columbian, pre-everything. Okay? So... But what happened, and, I, and I'm writing this essay, it's called From Indianization, because we were all Indianized, to de-Indianization. Because when, when, when white folks took control, they began to determine who the Indians are. Because the Indians have a, have a psychological and emotional connection to the land. But if you can redefine them out of existence, like they legislate Indians out of existence, like I've been talking about, then you can detach them from the land. So you got Indians running around calling themselves Hispanics, Latinos, Mexican Americans. These cats are, are indigenous. Okay, now they call them the Indians too, in their own land. And there's a book called Foreigners in Their Own Land. Uh, but it, but the, but the point I'm trying to but the point I'm trying to make is that Native America is a federally recognized, federally constructed contractual identity. Than anything to do with race. Okay, so, but people use that word, uh, word interchangeably. Uh, Indian and Native American. Okay? Because there's a lot of Indians. There's more Indians than there are any other race in the Western Hemisphere. And I say that unpolitic. It's true. They don't know it. Well, They're lost. Well. They're lost. Yeah. Absolutely lost. But if you ask me, Apache, identify yourself. I'll tell you. Isha Shilan. So just call me in here. Keep it simple. You just asked him, well, why would you do that? Because you said earlier, um, I have my Indian name, and that's it. No. I have another name. No. So why wouldn't you use those terms? They're, 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 because I'm in an audience, okay, where I have to give them training wheels. Okay. Okay? Right? But then you would go back to using that. I, I, I'm Indian in the sense that I'm indigenous. Okay? I'm not Native American in the sense that I have been federally recognized by an invading power, okay, who selectively chooses, decides who they want to be Native American. Because they'll tell you, oh, there's a man after me, two million Native Americans. No, I, I think there's like 40 million. Okay? But, 
But you know what? They ain't going to let you have that. They're not going to give you that. And, and that's my point about being defined. Okay, there's a Shoshone lady in my book. I talk about her. She says, the white man no longer has to shoot, uh, shoot down Indians. They just redefine them. Okay? They just redefine them. It's the same thing with the genocide and termination through legislation. It's the same thing. It's the very same thing. You had a question, Marilyn? No, you answered it. Uh, I did. I had one more. This is kind of like a... This you better start paying, man. Earlier. That's too many questions. You better start paying up. <laughs> well, you, you're very knowledgeable, so this is a chance to... Well, you said earlier about uh, moving the Indians to the west. Was that because there was more land? What was the rationale behind... Good, well, good the rest, question. Okay. The east? When, 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 when the... Uh, uh, you got to remember when the colonies were here, they were outnumbered by indigenous people. Okay, and then they had to go to war against England, the Revolutionary War. They really couldn't, the reason why they made treaties is because they really couldn't put up a military fight. Okay, and they didn't have the economy to fight them, or they didn't have the, the consolidation cohesion as a nation to fight them yet. So every treaty they made, they knew was a lie. They were buying time. So eventually, after the war with England, and after they consolidated themselves economically, politically, militarily, then they say, you know what, it's time for you to go. And that's when they started pushing, because we can deal, we can deal with you now. They had, now they had more numbers, they had more power. Okay, when they, when they built uh, telephone lines, a uh, telephone, uh, remember they used to have the, uh, what they call it? Uh, telegraph. The telegraph. They, Indians call them uh, talking trees. So they put them all over the, uh, all over the, the, the uh, middle America and, 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 and western part of America. And they would go to you and say, look, man, we don't want no land, we don't want no water, we don't want your animals. We just want to put up these talking trees. Go ahead, man. So they did. And then they built the railroad through Indian lands and so forth. Hey, man, we don't want to, we just want to build these, sir. Okay. So what they did in the process was gain intelligence, and now they had the ability to move people militarily. All right? When Spain, when Spain was driven out of, uh, of uh, uh, Mexico, okay, the Americans came to the New Mexican, uh, the Mexican government and said, hey, man, we're going to build a highway for you through New Mexico and Arizona and New Mexico free. Thanks. They did. And that's what they used to the native. Okay? So they're always thinking. They knew what they were doing. There was no intention of keeping those trees. And, and the issue I have now that I've read this book and done some other studies is that man will get caught up on the trees. It's about power. You have to manufacture power. And you have to learn how to manufacture power. Well, shut up. Quit looking for pity. Quit looking for logic. It's about power. When you got power, you can do any damn thing you want. Power's not bad. Bad people make bad power. Good people make good power. So we have to understand that the whole idea is about manufacturing power. And questions like on the scene helps us manufacture that power. And books like this helps us manufacture that power. You know. So, but I appreciate those questions.